Hello everyone, welcome to 10 Minute Physiology. In today's video, we're going to talk about the vestibular system. So with that, let's give it a go. So what is the vestibular system used for? So the vestibular system is mainly going to be used for balance. And it's important to realize that both balance and auditory information both move into the central nervous system by cranial nerve number 8. So the sensory functional unit for both the sense of balance and auditory sensation is going to be the hair cell. So the hair cell is drawn right here, and the hair cell is the sensory unit for both the auditory and vestibular systems. Now hair cells are cells with hair bundles on top of them, and the, each hair bundle contains maybe, probably around 150 different hair fibers. Now, these hair cells are going to be excitable cells that depolarize and release neurotransmitters. So these are going to be the sensory unit for both the vestibular and auditory systems. So now let's take a closer look at what these hair cells actually do. So in general, there are two different hair cells that we're going to talk about in this video. So the first hair cell is going to be the type 1 hair cell. And the first distinctive feature of these hair cells is that these hair cells are more bulbous at the bottom. Now, there are a number of important parts on the hair cell. And the first one that we're going to talk about is going to be the stereovilli. So the stereovilli are shown right here. And these stereovilli are basically going to be hair fibers that protrude from the hair cell. Now, the tallest of the hair fibers is going to be the kinocelium. So the kinocelium is going to be the tallest of them. Now, another important part of the hair cell is going to be the tip links. And the tip links are going to be proteins that connect these hair fibers together. Now, on each hair fiber, you basically have a channel which is represented by the yellow rectangle. And these channels are potassium channels that allow potassium to flow into the cell. And these particular potassium channels are mechanically gated. And we'll talk about how that mechanism works in a little bit. So in addition to the hair cells, we also have these support cells. And these support cells form tight junctions with the hair cells. Now, one of the other distinctive features of the type 1 hair cell is going to be the fact that the afferent dendrites that innervate them completely envelop their bases, as we see right here. And we also have an efferent axon here as well. So now that we know what the type 1 hair cell looks like, let's look at the other type of hair cell. So the other type of hair cell looks something like this. And what we see, first of all, this type of hair cell looks very similar to the type 1, but one difference is that the bottom isn't as bulbous. And this particular hair cell is called the type 2 hair cell. Now, it's important to realize that the type 2 hair cell also has a lot of the same parts that the type 1 hair cell has. But one of its distinctive features is that the afferent dendrite that innervates it doesn't envelop the whole cell. And we also have support cells forming tight junction with these hair cells as well. Now, as we've been talking about, these hair cells and support cells form tight junctions. And this basically creates two fluid compartments. The first is going to be the endolymph here. And the second is going to be the perilymph. Now the endolymph is high in its potassium concentration and the perilymph is low. This means that there is a strong electrochemical gradient that drives potassium from the endolymph into the perilymph. And this is going to be incredibly important when it comes to the sensation mechanisms that we'll talk about in a, in a second. So how do these hair cells actually generate a signal? So in order to understand that, what we're going to do is we're going to imagine we have our two hair cells and we basically move our head to a certain position. Now let's just say when we move our head to a certain position, this causes the endolymph to move in this direction. Now when the endolymph moves in this direction, this causes the stereovilli to move toward the kinocelium in both of these hair cells. Now when the stereovilli move towards the kinocelium, this basically causes the opening of these channels at the tips of these hair fibers, which allows potassium to move into the cell. Now when potassium moves into the cell, this causes a depolarization which opens voltage-gated calcium channels which allows vesicular fusion to take place. When vesicular fusion takes place, the neurotransmitters of aspartate and glutamate are released onto the afferent dendrite. Now the potassium that entered into the cell 
leaves the cell through potassium channels and enters into the perilymph going down its electrochemical gradient. So that's basically how the cell depolarizes and releases neurotransmitters onto the afferent dendrite. Now there's two important concepts that you should gather from this. First of all, when the stereovilli move toward the kinocelium, the potassium channels on them open, allowing potassium to flow into the cell. However, the opposite occurs when the stereovilli move away from the kinocelium. When the stereovilli move away from the kinocelium, the potassium channels close, which therefore keeps potassium from entering into the cell, which therefore decreases the amount of calcium, which therefore decreases vesicular fusion, which therefore decreases the release of glutamate and aspartate. So we have a number of regions inside our internal ear that basically measure our sense of balance. The first regions are going to be the utricle and saccule, as you see right here. So the saccule is oriented in the vertical direction, so 90 degrees, and the utricle is oriented in the horizontal position, or 25 degrees. Now the utricle and saccula are going to basically measure static positions. And the next regions are going to be the ampullae. So the ampullae are basically enlarged regions on your semicircular canals, and the ampullae are basically going to measure acceleration. So we're going to begin by first talking about the utricle and saccule, specifically how they work. So here is a photo of both the utricle and saccule. So this right here on the left-hand side is the saccule, and this right here is the utricle. So let's identify all the parts in this diagram. So the first part here is these hair cells, as we see right here. And one important feature that you should notice in the saccule is that the kinocelium on each hair cell are oriented away from this midline or the reversal line. Another important part is the afferent dendrites, which receive signals from the hair cells. Another important region is the perilymph, which is represented by this yellow-green regions here. This region is the endolymph, or the pink region here. And this right here is a specific thing called the autolith membrane. So the autolith membrane is basically this membrane that surrounds these crystals, which are represented by these cylinders. And these crystals are made up of calcium carbonate. And basically what this membrane does is it's attached to these hair cells here. And because it's attached to these hair cells, it sort of acts as a weight, which aids in moving the hair fibers. And when it aids in moving the hair fibers, it basically increases the strength of a signal. So the autolith membrane here is incredibly important because it aids in the movement of the hair fibers, because it sort of acts as a weight, which aids in their movement. Now, another important region is the reversal line here. And what we see for the saccule is that the kinocelium are all oriented away from this reversal line. So in the saccule, the kinocelium of each hair bundle face away from the midline. In the utricle, we have a different region here. And in the utricle, we see that the kinocelium of each hair bundle face towards the midline. So that is one big difference. And another thing that we see in the utricle that's a little different from the saccule is the presence of these vestibular dark cells, which basically secrete potassium into the endolymph, as we see right here. So that's basically the parts of the utricle and saccule. So now let's talk about how these things actually work. So let's just say you have two hair cells, and these two hair cells are basically going to be connected to the autolith membrane, which we see right here and the autolith membrane is filled with the calcium carbonate crystals. Now we basically have a right hair cell and a left hair cell. And what we see with these hair bundles is that the kinocelium in the left hair cell are oriented away from the midline, and the kinocelium here are also oriented away from the midline. So let's just say we basically move the person's head in such a way that the autolith membrane moves this way. So when the autolith membrane moves this way, this is going to basically drive the movement of the stereovilli in the following directions. For the left hair cell, the stereovilli are going to move toward the kinocelium, as we see right here. And when this occurs, this opens those potassium channels, which allows potassium to flow into the cell, which depolarizes the cell, allowing calcium to flow into the cell, and therefore fascicular fusion to take place, releasing glutamate and aspartate. Now on the right hair cell, what we see is that when the autolith membrane moves in this direction, 
the stereovilli move away from the kinocelium. This means that the potassium channels close, which decreases the amount of potassium inside the cell, which therefore decreases the amount of glutamate and aspartate released by these cells. So in other words, we have the left hair cell releasing neurotransmitters and the right hair cell not releasing neurotransmitters. So what the, will happen is that the central nervous system will interpret this as moving the head downward. So based upon which hair cells are activated, the central nervous system will basically integrate those signals and basically examine where you are in space, so how your head is moved. So now we're going to talk about the ampulla, which is going to measure acceleration. So the ampulla are going to be the enlarged regions at the bases of the semicircular canals. And what we see here are a few important parts. So the first important part is going to be the hair cells themselves. Now the hair cells, as you see here, are going to be interacting with a specific membrane called the cupola. So what is the cupola? So the cupola is a membrane that sort of acts as a sail in the wind. So basically what happens is, is when you have your endolymph moving through the semicircular canal, which we see right here, what happens is, is that the endolymph will basically, when it moves in this direction, will blow the cupola in this direction. And when the cupola basically blows like a wind in the sail, what happens is, is it aids in the movement of the hair fibers on the hair cells, and it therefore generates a signal. So the cupola is sort of similar to the autolith membrane, except in this case, the cupola is sort of like a big sail. So the other important parts on the ampulla are the following. We also have the crista ampullaris, which is the ridge in which the hair cells are found. And we also have the vestibular dark cells, which secrete potassium into the endolymph. And then outside, we have the perilymph. So that's basically how the ampulla work. So I hope this video helped you understand what the vestibular sense is and how we sense our sense of balance. And I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.